Have you ever thought to yourself, there has to be more than this? Why does it seem like life has a way of making us feel less? Not just feel like less, but feel less, as in numb, leaving us to wonder if this is it. Is this all that life has for us? We spend every day just trying to make it from one item on our calendar to the next, from one email to the next, from one soul-crushing moment to the next. Was this God's plan? Is there more to life than this? What if God really does have more for us? More love, more joy, more peace, more purpose, more hope. What if God is the God of more? And what if the life we've been searching for is really found as we surrender our lives more and more to Jesus? Because Jesus is offering us a way to live life that is more than we've ever even dreamed of. We are Altitude Church. We are here to help you become more like Jesus. So, what are you becoming? Good morning and welcome to Altitude Church and happy Mother's Day. I know what it takes to be a mom, so kudos to all you moms out there who've done such a great job. Just for those of you who this is your first time joining us, we would love to hear from you. So just email us and just by joining us this morning, we're going to donate $5 towards the battle against sex trafficking. So thank you so much. Also for those of you who have been a part of Altitude Church, well, forever, that's okay. We'd still like to hear from you as well. Maybe you have a prayer request or maybe a praise. We would love to share those with you. So you can also email us and we will certainly take that time to pray with you or give praise with you. So thank you for that. And this is going to be our last series before we're not going to be meeting together like we normally do on Sunday morning. However, we're going to be having our first interest party. And that's going to happen on Sunday, May 30th. We're going to be celebrating and you're going to see just what's going to happen over the summer when we bring people from our community into Altitude Church to be a part of our launch team. Watch for more information. You'll find it on social media and through our website. Here at Altitude Church, we exist because of what you give. So for those of you who have been giving, thank you so much. If you haven't had a chance to be a part of Altitude Church and, and giving through Altitude Church, we would love to have you do that. You can do it online, you can do it through mail, and you can also do it here at the church. So thank you again for all that you do to make ministry happen here at Altitude. This morning, we're going to be celebrating communion together. So if you could, grab something that resembles bread and, and something that is like juice and join us for this sacred time after the message. We're going to jump into our time of worship now, so please join us. And again, welcome to Altitude Church.
Hey Altitude Church, Kyle Hayes here from Children of Promise and we just wanted to say a huge thank you for your generosity and partnership during our Rethink Sponsorship campaign here in the month of April. Together we are changing the lives of children around the world. The $25,000 matching gift that you provided us was a game changer for our campaign, no doubt about it. We were able to grow that by two and a half times to a total of $62,500 towards our new GAP fund, as well as well over 30 children being sponsored all around the world. And this amount of money will be a, a game changer, as I've said, for children taking those next steps after they graduate the program into their future dreams. One of my favorite stories related to the GAP fund is about a young guy named Jonathan Mendez from Quito, Ecuador, high in the Andes Mountains. Jonathan and his siblings lived on less than $2 a day, and education was just not a possibility for him. But because his sponsor helped him jump the gap to university, getting him into college, he is now a degree-holding mechanical engineer with an invention that has been accepted by the Ecuadorian government with a patent that is being used around the country now to help people expedite agriculture. And hear what I'm saying here, none of that would have happened if he hadn't been given access to education, if he hadn't been given a seat at the table to jump the gap of poverty first as a sponsored kid and then jump that gap into university. It changed his life and now is changing his country. And when you partner with Children of Promise in ways you already have and we're so grateful for, it does that kind of change all around the world. And so on behalf of the team here, we wanted to say a big and huge thank you to your team, to the congregation. We would love to come out and see you in person sometime and visit and share more stories of how Children of Promise is making wholeness possible by the grace of God. For now, if you don't already, make sure and subscribe to our free newsletter where we share monthly stories, prayer requests, and soon, soon, travel opportunities. We plan to update supporters soon as possible on how the GAP Fund dollars are already making a difference for kids who have been awaiting sponsorship. Follow us on all the socials below and invite a friend to follow along because we are working on some really exciting things behind the scenes right now to assist you, your church, and churches around the world in connecting with one another to learn and make wholeness possible together. Have a great week.
Hey, Altitude Church, I am honored to be here this morning, and I'm so thankful to Lee for inviting me to speak on one of my favorite topics, resurrecting joy. I'm going to jump right in here and start with part of our scripture basis for this morning. I encourage you to open your Bible or your YouVersion app to John 16, 25 through 30. It states, I have spoken these things to you in figures of speech. A time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. On that day you will ask in my name, and I am not telling you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I come from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world. You see, Jesus' figurative speech previously was intended to sustain them in a world of tribulation and to give them peace in him who has overcome the world, as we will later see in verse 33. He's now preparing them for what's to come in plain text. It's true that the world wants to overcome us, but when we yield ourselves to Christ and trust in him, he enables us to be overcomers. The choice is up to us. When we have a better understanding of this world, we understand how he wants us to live. When I think of a joyful person, I think of how there must also be, they, there must be a deep faith to have complete joy, no matter what tragedy comes. Now that might sound weird to address tragedy when I'm speaking about resurrecting joy, but how can we even know what joy is if we don't have sadness or sorrow first? To put it in the wise words of our favorite Christian rapper, Andy Minio, what if Batman were baneless? Would we know good without evil? Would we know happiness without sadness? It also makes me think of times in my own life when I've experienced sadness or tragedy or sorrow. For the most part, I've always been a pretty happy person. I've even been accused of smiling too much, if that makes any sense. Now, Linda will tell you that part of the reason I'm here is because she saw me in a meeting with Lee and she liked my smile, so she told him to hire me. Thanks for that, Linda. <laughs> with that, the next thing that comes to mind was a time when I was actually sinking into a depression. Now, this is very unlikely for me. It's not typical. As I said, I'm usually the one with the smile on my face. I'm a very happy and joyful person, no matter what the circumstance. However, this time I'm thinking of is when I had just been to a World Vision Child Ambassador Conference. If you aren't familiar with them, World Vision is a Christian humanitarian organization that me and my family works with as volunteer child ambassadors. At this conference, I learned of the devastations of child trafficking and brothels in the most impoverished places like Bangladesh. As I listened to our speaker share of his experience as he walked down the middle of a small dirt road, on one side was the sounds of the devastations coming from within the brothel. And on the other side, was the happiness and joy and laughter from children. Children were part of the family-friendly spaces that were now there as a part of this community. In fact, we had even equipped and educated, empowered women who were former madams right across the street to take their children out from under their beds and walk across the street and become part of the space they're not only there now, but they're teachers and they're thriving community members. Now, I'm going to get back to that story in just a minute, but do you think that there is any mistake that our current building and our new building is right where it is geographically located? It's no surprise when I think about this and visualizing that story the speaker was sharing about the family-friendly spaces on one side of the street and the brothels on the other side of the street, that our new Altitude Church building is positioned right across from some of the greatest needs in our local community. From one of the lowest funded schools in our district to our local mission partners like Beyond Home and Hope House who are just within miles of us. The fact that our vision for Altitude Church is to be an epicenter of hope and God has positioned us in a building and in a community in a state where hope is so greatly needed. Now, at that same conference, I also learned that I had reached a long-time goal of my own, and I had earned a vision trip by finding sponsors for over 40 children that year, and I got to go into the field and meet one of my sponsored children. Now, 
that's a whole nother story that I could go on and on about. So if you're interested in hearing about my either one of my trips, I would love to have coffee and share that with you. But I'm gonna stay on focus and stay on topic now on resurrecting joy. So I found out that I got to go to Rwanda. My dream for years and years since I was probably seven years old had been go to Africa on mission. So this was 100% a dream come true. While in Rwanda, again, I experienced more hope and yet more devastation. I got to go on a water walk with a community. Here's a picture of a beautiful country of Rwanda. As I was doing the water walk, this woman who saw that I was struggling with the jerry can on top of my head, she stopped me to give me her headpiece so that it would be more comfortable and so that I could make it the rest of the way up the mountain. And it was a total funny story also because I begged them to fill my jerry can, but it was actually only about three quarters of the way full. I kept telling them I'm strong and I can do it, but they refused to fill it fully for me. When we got to the top, we were told that that was actually the walk that the, this community used to have to go to. So then we got to go to the new well. We had visited a wash project where we were welcomed by women and some men who had the joy of sharing to us, sharing with us what they had experienced. <laughs> If that is not joy, I do not know what is. Then we got to go to the new well. We also visited a wash project where we were welcomed by the singing and joy of these women and a few men who couldn't wait to share their stories of success. It's important to remember that there wasn't always joy there though. It's through hard work, pain, and trust in the Lord that joy was on the other side waiting for them. The next day we learned more about this incredible country. We learned in depth about the genocide and the devastations of what happened during that short period of time. We visited the Off Path Genocide Museum, not the one the tourists go to. It actually had preserved bodies in it and it showed that they are still finding bodies to this day. We also learned about reconciliation. We got to visit the very church where the first round of reconciliations was started just a few months after the genocide. This was first founded by Pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Church, the first American church to assist after the genocide. In this church at this time, there were men and women, again, on opposite sides of the church, that one side sat the victims who they didn't want to be called victims. They were survivors. And on the other side sat the former Hutu child soldiers who were given machetes, some at the age of 9, 10, 11 years old. They were told to kill anybody who was a Tutsi or didn't look like them. Here's a photo of this amazing man and woman who were there on the first day of this church reconciliation when the community came together and started settling from the genocide, this man actually thought he killed this woman. He saw her around the community and he thought she was a ghost. It was shortly after the genocide and everywhere he would go, he would see her and see he knew who she was because they had gone to the same church and she sang in the church choir. He stepped into the church on that day wanting forgiveness. While he stood at the back of the church, this woman came forward to share her story. It was shocking to him that she was alive. It was the first time he realized that she had survived. Even though she, he cut off her arm and killed everyone in her family, she was actually able to crawl to a stream and hide under the water, only coming up for a breath when she thought that it was safe. As she came to the front of the church, and was speaking about this at that time, he walked from the back of the church and shared that it was him who killed her. Watching them and hearing them recreate this story of reconciliation, it was just overwhelming to me. Despite him cutting off her arm and losing her entire family because of him, she gave him forgiveness. They were there to stare their stories they did it with love and with joy. At this point, it was crazy. They were interacting almost like brother and sister. While she was talking, he would answer her phone. And while he was talking, she was helping with his children. 
it was amazing to see this transformation. And again, it goes back to what Lee said last week. It's not about our situations. It's about our transformations. It's not about what this man had been carrying with him for that period of time or what had happened to her. This country and this community had been transformed. You see, 86% of Rwandans are Christian. If you ever have a chance to go to Rwanda, you will see it from the time you step off the plane. Everywhere I looked, there were people cleaning and working and shucking rice. And I mean, they did it with so much joy. They would help each other in their businesses. And it was just pure beauty to watch. One of the most impoverished countries in the world. And this whole time that I was there, I didn't come across one beggar, nobody asking for anything. Oh, well, except the children who came running after our van and all they really wanted was candy. So one of my fellow child ambassadors, Joe, who is my mentor, asked my driver if we could stop and talk to the kids. One of the children who must have been in school because she had a uniform and spoke English, she said, how are you? And I returned the greeting in her language, morajo. And then she saw the bracelet I had on. It said champion on it. She looked at my bracelet and said, champion, I will be champion. I had no choice, of course, but to give her that bracelet. Getting back to the beginning, when I spoke of tragedy being an important piece of experiencing joy. While we were there, I felt their joy. I felt hope. And even though we were learning of the beauty of World Vision being in a community, I had met my sponsored child. Look at that face. Is that not gorgeous? <laughs> and at conference, had learned about the beauty of family-friendly friendly spaces that were built. Yet somehow I managed to come home with the heaviness of everything I had witnessed. Between the devastation I had learned at my conference and the experience in Rwanda, instead of focusing on the most happy and joyful moments, I allowed Satan to get into my heart and into my head and steal that joy from me. To be sad when someone didn't want to hear me talk about it and to be sad when someone didn't want to sponsor a child or when someone didn't want to join our global 6K walk for water, I would get so angry that I would just shut down. And some days I didn't even want to get out of bed. My husband probably doesn't even know this, but there was a time when I wanted to just cancel our 6K because I thought, well, nobody wants to do it anyway. I didn't understand how people wouldn't want to be a part of making a difference, of bringing hope and making a change. So one day I found myself in a conversation with my dear friend, Becca Shea. She spoke with me and asked about how I was doing in general and how things are going with the walk for water. And I responded in the same way I just described to you. I explained that as I shared my sadness and devastation, my doom and my gloom, and I just kept focusing on all the horrible things I had seen and why won't anyone help? And she got right on me and she said, Chandra, you're gonna be really mad at me, but I have to tell you something. God does not need you. <laughs> that hit me like a ton of bricks. She said, he may want you and he may want to use your gifts, but he doesn't need you. All he needs is your joy. That's your job. He can use that for good. She said, do you think that he can use you when you're so sad that you're letting Satan keep you in bed and that you're not doing anything? All you're doing is focusing on the devastation and the tragic stories. She went on and on and she prophesied to me and prayed over me and spoke over me and she rebuked Satan and reminded me of who I am in Christ and who we all are in him. My friendship with her began shortly after I discovered her music and began following her on social media. Another cool story I'll share at a later time. Anyway, during this conversation, she reminded me that our friendship was there because the joy I conveyed, even on social media, is what attracted her to follow me back and led to our beautiful friendship. We had about three weeks left until our global 6K, maybe 10 people registered and right around $300 raised so far. I began to speak with joy. I shifted my focus on the transformation of the communities where we were receiving clean water. I, tr I focused on the beauty of the new wells and I, and I started to think about the 10 people that had signed up. And oh my gosh, that's 10 more people with clean water. 
I focused on the longest pipeline in the world that we had just built in Kenya. Fast forward three weeks, and we had raised over $3,200 for clean water. We had a successful event, and once again, God succeeded. My next vision trip was to Cambodia. And I have to share a bit of this experience as well, because when I think of resurrecting joy, I immediately have a picture in my head of children dancing in water, of the beauty that comes when a successful well is used for the first time. But allow me to start with the first day of our trip. The joy and the beauty of Rwanda was non-existent in the most vulnerable areas of Cambodia. It was only devastation. See, World Vision had just began building relationships and hadn't even started their work yet. I sat in a circle with elementary school age children and listened to child after child speak of tragedy, of not having clean water or health care. We listened to women speak of the domestic violence and abuse that they were experiencing. The devastation of domestic violence was greater than anything I had ever witnessed. The children cried. They cried to us in desperation. They didn't have hope. They didn't have joy. But they also didn't have God. Most of the community of Cambodia is either atheist or Buddhist or of a different type of religion that doesn't believe in God. Even some areas have traditionally been satanic. And you could feel it in that country. I will tell you, this took me months to process after my return to the U.S., this photo shows the community we first visited. These children, they were desperate for education, for water, for just peace in their homes. They didn't know that by sharing their hearts with us, they were essentially asking in the Father's name as we were a group of people who put our trust and hope in the Lord. After all, that's why we were there, to learn their needs, to learn their hearts to learn and to let our hearts break for the things that break the heart of God and to do all we can to help them transform their communities. Upon returning to the U.S., we were all hit hard. COVID had taken over. Our family had big struggles personally with our son and with our school. And then the lockdown happened. And for me, and I'm guessing for many of us, it was a perfect breeding ground for sadness to take over. Once again, I hadn't processed what I had just experienced in Cambodia, and I hadn't, and really took no time to even share photos or stories with family and friends, which is a huge part of being able to reassimilate in a world after being in the mission field. Thankfully, it didn't last too long because six months later, I found myself at another one of those leadership child ambassador conferences. This one was online and of course, <clears throat> and our leader said she had a surprise for those of us who went to Cambodia. She brought on the screen this gentleman, Verik. He was the national director in Cambodia and we had met him while we were there. He shared that because of our involvement and our sharing the joy and love of Jesus, that they had already, just five months later, received their first major water project. Talk about transformation from head to toe. Abba Father's love stretched out and it was made evident to these children. They knew we weren't leaving just like the Father doesn't leave us. Literally, he used us in this great organization to resurrect joy in the form of life-giving water to this community who just a few months ago had no joy and no hope. Another sweet story from my time there was when we were in a community that was completely atheist. We were there learning about schooling so that there were lots of kids around. And as I was looking around at all these children, this blessing song, my friend Becca's version of it, kept coming to my head. And I just felt like I need to sing. And so I asked if I could sing and the leader said, sure, why not? And so I sang to them and they were completely mesmerized. They said they'd never been sung to before. Can you imagine an elementary student never being sung to before? So then they stopped and said, we want you guys to all sing something else. So myself and fellow child ambassadors sang Jesus Loves Me. It was amazing standing in an ungodly area and singing to them, Jesus loves me. Joy is contagious. 
as I sing the blessing over them. Joy, they wanted more of it. Even though they didn't have faith, even though they didn't know the songs or even the Lord at the time, they still wanted more of it. I can't wait to go back at some point and see how these communities have changed and not just physically and economically, but their spiritual growth. Switching gears for a moment, I listened to a talk a few years back about Martha and Mary. We read how Mary, Martha, takes her frustrations about Mary out on Jesus. Martha is just done with how Mary takes time and sits with Jesus and doesn't do anything. Martha is running around taking care of all the details. One of the most frustrating things to me is how she doesn't even talk to Mary about it. She actually just comes at Jesus. Luke 10 40 says, but Martha was distracted by her many tasks and she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. Martha did not have joy. I think she was actually hoping that Jesus would put Mary in her place and give Martha some accolades about the job she's doing. But to Martha's surprise, that's not how Jesus responded. While I'm not going to go into further detail about that story, I encourage you to read it again this week and just see what kind of emotions come up for you as you look at it from a little different perspective. My point in sharing with you this story is that if Martha could only stop to see the joy that she was allowing others to receive by sharing her gift of service on that day, then maybe she would serve with a better attitude. I can never get over the fact that she complained to Jesus. I mean, can you even imagine? I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> as I read this story again and again, during this specific talk that I was listening to, I had an epiphany about my own mom, which is why I wanted to share this particular story with you today on Mother's Day. The Martha in my life is my mom, Mama J, who is here with us this morning, and I know she's watching online. <laughs> Although Mama J has the heart of Martha's gift in serving, she differs immensely as she not only cares about relationship, but she does it with joy. She serves with joy with all her heart, soul, mind, and strength. She will take care of all the details. She'll allow my husband and I to have a dinner party, help cook. See, she lives with us. Well, she'll help cook if I actually let her because I'm pretty stingy with my kitchen. <laughs> but <laughs> she'll just come, say hi to my friends, go down to her space, and then come back and help with dishes and anything that's needed. All that also that I can nurture relationships in my own life. Now, where she also differs with Martha is that she doesn't complain. In fact, if I try to help, she'll tell me, no, no, Chan, you go sit with your friends and family. I've got this. The main difference between Martha and Mama J is joy. My mom taught me joy without realizing that's what she was doing. And just like Lee said last week, joy does not come from situations. It comes from our transformations. It's more than happiness. It's a state of being. For when from the time I was the cootie girl on the playground to high school when our house was egged because I was the only one who didn't want to drink and do drugs, but I also took a stand against it. To the relationships as I grew, to um, issues in our family, divorce, even dealing with other parents as an adult. Her old adage, kill him with kindness. She's a survivor and she taught me to be one too. I won't get into all the things she's overcome in her life, but her attitude and the way she's overcome so much, it isn't derived from the situations. It's derived from joy. Joy and hope that comes from the Lord is contagious. Just like our last series, You Don't Have to Advertise a Fire, when we have joy, others want to be a part of it. Mama J gets behind everything that's important to me and to our family. Mom, I know you're watching. I don't thank you enough, and I just want to honor you and say thank you today. My radiance is found when I seek your face. That's one of my favorite lines from my friend Becca's song, Joy. Our radiance is found when we seek your face. It's important that we recognize joy that comes from a family, from community, and from relationships of both believers and non-believers. It's contagious. I have a client years back 
who during the middle of a personal training session, one time she said to me, Chandra, I just want you to know that when you speak about your faith, I sometimes don't respond and I'm really quiet. I felt really bad and I was like, oh shoot, okay, maybe I just talked too much and I kind of felt myself apologizing. She said, no, don't apologize. I actually want to hear you talk. She said, I don't respond because I was raised an atheist. I don't understand this whole faith thing, but you're like always happy in a good mood. So I like to hear what you have to say. That was so cool. What a great moment just to have that with her and to know that just because I'm sharing my experiences, she's maybe getting something out of it. Joy is contagious. As last week we prayed for endurance that leads to joy, I wanna challenge you to share that joy with others, to allow your joy to be contagious, to look at opportunities to share a smile, a cup of coffee, or a meal with someone. Sometimes simply inviting them into your story will mean more than you can imagine. Imagine a city transformed by hope. That is our mission and vision. Even though sometimes it's scary to invite someone in and we're afraid of the no's, it's easier than we think. My dear friend Heather and her family have been coming here since the first day I started at this church, but they didn't come simply because I asked them to. She came because I was in the middle of a workout with her and just sharing of the things that I love about this place and about why I accepted the job. She's the one who said, well, we're coming and we're gonna be there for you this weekend. They haven't left. I ask you to remember that as we go forward into the summertime and to the weeks ahead, that they're gonna look a little different from what we've been used to, but remember that we are here to speak with bold faith and with joy. On that day, you will ask in my name, and I am not telling you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I'm leaving the world and going into the Father. John 16, 26 through 28. Starting May 30th, for several weeks, we will leave the comfort of this building as we know it, and we will go to the Father with our hearts and with our souls. We will seek His face. We will seek greater outreach in our community, and we will seek inviting others into this place because the Father loves us and we love Him. And with that, we are called to joyfully make disciples and invite other people into our faith journey. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 19. Jesus responded to them, Do you now believe? Indeed, an hour is coming and has come when each of you will be scattered to his own home, and you will leave me alone, yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. John 16, 31 through 32. I wanna wrap things up with a story my husband introduced me to a few weeks back about the bamboo tree. You see, the bamboo seed, once planted, for the first year, it produces no leaf. Nothing comes out of the soil for the first four years of its life. It doesn't grow more than about an inch. Even being watered and nurtured and fertilized, it doesn't grow. And then usually within the fifth year of its life, it explodes within six months time to 100 feet tall. All because during that first four years, its foundation and roots were growing. I believe like many of you that the seed was Pastor Lee and his family moving here nearly four years ago. The next few months for Altitude Church is going to be like that six months where we may not see exponentially what the tree is doing, but we will be growing a foundation, growing roots stronger than ever into the community. And as this bamboo is preparing for exponential growth, we will be doing the same. As the bamboo shoots through that soil, that's what's happening for Altitude Church, my friends. We are producing roots and foundation for the community. Imagine a city transformed by hope. When we allow our joy that comes from the Lord to show, we show hope, hope that lives here, not in these four walls or online, but in the love of each and every one of us as Christ lives in us. 
so that when we open our doors on September 19th, that joy and hope explodes out just like the bamboo tree to 100 feet tall, to hundreds of people in the building. The church is going to explode out and reach new people searching for something different. It's the foundation that starts our growth toward welcoming in and transforming that 1% of Denver's market. So let's come together, share our stories, share love and hope, and resurrect the joy that lives within us. Joy is contagious. Again, I'm leaving the world and going to the Father, his disciples said. Look, now you're speaking plainly and not using any figurative language. Now we know that you know everything and don't need anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. Jesus responded to them, Do you now believe? Indeed, an hour is coming and has come when each of you, we, will be scattered, but not only to our own home, but into the community. And you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is in me. And here's the best part. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering, whether it's a loss or of a something as tragic as a genocide or losing a loved one or simply just a bad day. In this world, you will have trouble, but be courageous. I have overcome the world. Altitude family, pray with me. Abba Father, we thank you that on this beautiful day for all of our life experiences, for the joy that lives within us, that we can overcome the world just by believing in you and knowing that we can do it. We're so thankful for this church, for this day, and for what the future might hold for us. God, I just ask that as we step forward, we will realize that Almighty Father is here with us and that he can transform this community one person at a time. I thank, I thank you for Altitude Church personally for bringing me to this very special place where the Holy Spirit is so evident. Continue to be here with us, God, and to bless us as we go into our community and share our faith journey. We do all these things in your name and in your son's holy name. Amen. Communion is such a special thing, and I love that God is so clever even to have even designed this as something we can do anywhere at any time. After all, Jesus turned water into wine. So right where you are, find a cracker or a piece of bread and something to drink, juice, water, wine, whatever it might be. Think of this symbol of the body of Christ that is shed for you. John 15, 11 states, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy be in you and that your joy may be full. Take and eat for this is the blood and the body of Jesus Christ shed for you.
blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus Thanks for joining us today at Altitude Church Online. We are so glad that you chose to join us and worship together today. I want to let you know that this next couple weeks are the last pieces of new content that we're creating for a short season. You see, we are launching Altitude Church on September 19th of 2021 as a new life-giving church here in the Arvada part of the Denver metro area. And we want to invite you to be a part of it. So after May, you'll start to see a little intro with me telling you what's going on, but some of our previous content. We want to encourage you to let us know your email address and connect with us by going to nextstepsataltitude.church because we're going to be having interest parties, community engagement events, and so much more going on as we prepare for the launch. We'd invite you to be a part of that and to come back and see what God is doing. This church is 100% financially supported through your faithful and generous giving. If you'd like to support the ongoing ministry of Altitude Church and help us prepare for an even more powerful and more impactful launch than we've asked for or imagined, you can give online safely and securely anytime by using the link that's on the screen. Once again, we're so thankful that you are a part of Altitude Church. We invite you to be back next week as we continue our series, Resurrecting Joy. And we invite you to all of the things that are happening this summer by joining the launch team at the email address that's on the screen. We'll see you then.